Hi, everyone. My name is James So. I am an assistant professor at Stanford University. And I will tell you a little bit about some of the recent work that we've been doing in developing computer vision algorithms to study genomics, and in particular to study genomics across you know, different spatial variations and also across temporal variations. And this also will be an opportunity to give a tutorial of how we can actually leverage some of the recent advances in deep learning for computer vision. Great. So to set the stage for this presentation, right? So I want all of us to do a thought experiment together. So imagine if I've given you a list of descriptions of an individual, right? So here I've given you, you know, a list of descriptions, which could be taken from a medical record or from clinical notes. And what would I like you to do is to try to visualize in your head as much as possible of what the face of this person looked like. All right, so take a couple seconds to do that. Okay, and now I'm going to show you the actual face, right? So this is the, the actual face of this individual. And you can see how well your, the vision in your head, whether it agreed well with this image or not. Right. So the faces of this individual is actually very interesting. Right? This is taken from a, a New England Journal of Medicine article from a few years ago. So it's actually the face of a truck driver. And one thing that's quite notable is that this truck driver, is the face is actually quite asymmetric. Right? So you see one side of the face is actually much more wrinkly and sagged compared to the other side. And this is really because of the exposure to the sun right? when the truck driver is driving on one side and the window is closer to that side of the face. And it's a really nice image because first it captures quite vividly right, this interaction between the environment and between the, you know, the environmental exposures between the underlying biology of this individual and how this all affects the health status and disease outcomes of this individual. But it also captures, I think, a really important point, which is that there's actually a lot of information, very rich information in the images, right? And that's actually very hard to capture with your, you know, with the standard text descriptions, right? Because if we actually go back and look at the text, right? Um, you know, just based on this, my vision of what this person looked like is actually very different, much less rich and vivid compared to this actual image. Whereas the text would maybe have a few bytes of information, right? But whereas the image itself could actually contain some megabytes or even gigabytes of information. And this is the case for, you know, for even for images of humans, of faces, something that we're quite familiar with, right? And the problem is even more stark and even a bigger challenge if we're thinking about how to describe objects that are even smaller. Right? So here I actually have an image of a tumor biopsy from breast cancer tumor, right? And this is actually just uh, and on the right here, we actually, actually have a individual cell, it's a microglia, it's kind of an immune cell, which I'll come back to in a little bit. And here we have the motion from a microscope of this individual cell. Right, so how would we even describe this, these objects? Right, so that's actually quite challenging. Because, and the reason why it's challenging is because just in English, we really lack a very precise vocabulary with which to describe the phenotypes and morphologies and dynamics of these objects, right? It's hard enough for us to even precisely describe faces of individuals. It's even harder for us to describe these smaller objects like biopsies and individual cells. And this is really the motivation for this talk and for a lot of my research, right? When we think that the recent advances in computer vision, right? The goal is to really use those computer vision technologies to enable us to more deeply and more precisely phenotype these objects that would be hard for us to describe otherwise. And in particular, we want to use computer vision and to use these deep learning algorithms to basically create a new vocabulary, a new language of morphology. And this language actually then describes objects across different physical scales, from the scale of individual cells to that of humans and organisms. A lot of the work in my group is actually in developing these computer vision algorithms, right? So, and and, and many of these are actually also widely used by some of the companies that you're familiar with. Right? And a lot of the really advances in computer vision recently is based on advances in sort of artificial neural networks. 
Right, so I'll give some more examples of this throughout the talk. But let's say if you want to build, you know, like a, in this case, like a self-driving car, right? You, know, you would like to have the car to be able to look at the surroundings and to identify what are other cars and what are other individuals. Right? So you should be able to detect these different objects and to, quant you know, to characterize what they are. And in a nutshell, right, the kinds of algorithms that people currently use to, to detect and to classify these different objects using computer vision and using self-driving cars are really based on these different layers of convolutional neural networks. So it's a particular type of a deep learning algorithm. And what these algorithms are doing, again, this is just an overview, which I'll come back to in a little bit, is they're basically scanning across this image, right? So let's say if you're trying to detect the particular car, then the convolutional neural network will scan across this image, right? And so each column here corresponds to one layer of the convolutional network. So the initial layers, right, so these are the columns to the left here, are looking for local objects, right, in this car. So maybe it's looking for wheels or it's looking for windows. And some of the later layers, so the columns that are in the middle or to the right, are looking for higher level or more abstract concepts, right? And these layers come together in the end to come up with a classification, which the algorithm then classifies with some confidence whether this is a car or a truck or an airplane. So the goal of this talk is to give you a, a tutorial and to illustrate how we can apply these algorithms instead of looking for cars and for, you know, for computer vision tasks uh, in the world, how can we can actually use these technologies to really help us to understand you know, spatial variations in genomics as well as temporal variations, temporal dynamics in individual cells in a way that's directly relevant for human diseases. Okay. So how do we actually think about using these vision technologies for pathology, right? For to understand spatial heterogeneity and genomic heterogeneity. So the setting that we're working with here is actually in uh, in histology, right? So here's just this. Uh, here I'm showing you on the on the top left is a standard kind of image, a histology image taken from a breast cancer patient. Right, so these are kind of the routine image that people commonly generate. And uh, the pathologists would often look at these images by eye right, and then make some assessments and, and diagnosis of the, of the stages or the, um, of this patient. All right, so on the bottom left here, we actually have the, actually the clinical annotations by the pathologist of where in this image he or she believes to correspond to tumor regions and where it actually corresponds to normal cells, normal regions. Right, so, so these histology images are widely used and they're very powerful because it allows you to really capture the spatial heterogeneity right, of different cells and different, different parts of the tissue, different parts of the tumor in real time and in real space. In parallel, as many of you know, so there's also a very powerful set of technologies based on genomics and more recently based on single cell genomics, which captures you know, quite a complementary orthogonal types of information. Right, so typically what people do here then would be they will take these biopsy samples, they have to dissolve the cells right, to extract the individual single cells. And once they dissolve and extract individual cells, then they can do single cell, for example, transcriptome measurements or single cell sequencing to capture the expression profiles of those individual isolated cells. So these two different technologies both have pros and cons, right? So the advantage of the single cell or of the genomic analysis is that first, you actually have much richer information, right? For every individual cell, if you do RNA-seq, you actually have a lot of genes, you know, thousands of genes that are being measured. The disadvantage, the downside, is that you actually lose the original spatial information, right? You don't know which location in the tissue this cell comes from. So you lose actually the bigger context. The advantage of the histology imaging, this current pathology workflow, is that you do have the spatial context, right? Because you have the original tissue, but the, out, the measurements you see are fairly limited information, right? Maybe you see this is normal or, or you know, this is normal or malignant, but you don't actually really have the information about all this rich gene expression um, of thousands of genes for, for, uh, for these images, right? So there's a, certainly a trade-off between the two. 
And what we have been doing recently is to actually use computer vision to develop new technologies that allow us to get the best of both worlds, right? So you have both the spatial imaging data, and at the same time, you also have rich genomic readouts that are spatially resolved. So here's just an example application of our algorithm, which we call the STNet algorithm. So here's the input example, right? So on the, we have the histology image that we saw before from breast cancer patients from a biopsy. And the STNet, our algorithm, is able to impute the computationally synthesized spatial variations in gene expression profiles, right? So for example, let's say if you're interested in this gene FASN, which is one of the breast cancer, breast cancer biomarkers, then the STNet would be able to impute the expression profile for FASN on top of this histology image. It will, it will tell you the parts in yellow are the places where the FASN is highly expressed, and parts in blue is where this gene is lowly expressed. And if you're interested in a different gene, right, here I have just I have a, a second gene here, then the algorithm would also synthesize and instantaneously impute the gene expression profiles for the second gene. And with this, this algorithm, right, now we can actually impute the expression profiles that are spatially resolved for over 100 genes. And we have experimental measurements, right, actually using these spatial transcriptomic technologies, which I'll describe in the next slide, uh, to validate the, the computations from the algorithm. And they're actually in very good agreements here. Right, so this is done on, a, 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 on one of the test patients. Um, so just to be, just to you know, make sure everything's clear, right? So the second column here, these are computational predictions that are synthesized gene expression profiles directly from the histology image, right? Um, and then on the right here, right, the third column corresponds to the experimental measurements that we can use to validate uh, these computational predictions, and they're in good agreements. And if we have a different patient, right, if you have a second patient, right, maybe you have a different biopsy sample, a different histology image, that's also fine, right? So the algorithm would take a look at just this raw histology image and it's able to actually make profiles, right, for the gene expression of FASM and also for 100 other genes. And that also agrees quite well with the experimental measurements, right? And this is also quite interesting here, right, because this image itself, but with the standard clinical annotations, the pathology would actually say that, oh, this entire image is almost uniformly made of tumor regions, whereas the algorithm is able to detect that even within the, all of these tumor regions, there is still substantial spatial variation in the expressions of these key tumor genes and these key markers. And that can be very useful for more fine-grained and more precise you know, prognosis as well as for treatment planning. So this work was recently published, right? This, um, and it's uh, and you can find the the paper detail here. It's published a couple of months ago uh, in Nature Biomedical Engineering. Okay, so now I want to take a few minutes to explain a little bit more detail of how we actually develop this algorithm and how do we validate it and apply it. Right. So to train the algorithm, right, we actually need to collect actual experimental data that are spatially resolved transcriptomes. And this is actually done in collaboration with my fantastic collaborator, Joachim Blundberg, who is one of the, really the pioneers who developed these spatial transcriptomic technologies. Um, so how it works in a nutshell is the following. Right? Let's say if you have a breast cancer biopsy, right? there's a tiny little biopsy. And what you do is that Joachim has developed this chip. Right? So I have an example of this chip here. You basically overlay this biopsy tissue on top, directly on top of the chip. Now, what's special about the chip that you can develop is that you actually have some little probes on the chip, right? So those are little dots here in our cartoon. And each probe actually corresponds to a set of barcoded, basically barcoded needles, right? So think of this, each probe as corresponds to like a zip code that tell you where's the X, Y location of that probe. And what happens when you overlay the tissue on top of this chip is that these little needles will basically puncture and get into the cell, right? And once it gets into the cell, if it actually detects some transcripts in the cell, right, it would actually then attach a barcode, the spatial zip code on, you know, on top of the transcripts. And the beauty of this is that now when we actually sequence the cells afterwards, now we know exactly where the transcript come from, right? Because we have the barcode, the zip code attached to the transcript. 
So that's how we can experimentally measure that for this gene FASM, right? That's what, you know, the, here are the regions in the middle where it's highly expressed and the surrounding areas where it has low expressions, whereas for a different gene, XVP1, you have different special expression patterns. And this is quite high throughput in the sense that we can actually do this and then be able to measure expression values of several hundred to thousands of genes in parallel. Okay, so this is the training data that we generated to train and to validate our algorithm STNet. Right? And STNet itself, it's actually very similar to this kind of uh, you know, image recognition or self-driving car kinds of computer vision algorithms I showed you a few slides ago. Right, so in a nutshell, what STNet is doing is that it's also scanning across the individual image. Right, so it's looking at the local patches. I've shown you some examples here. Right, so each local patch is around 100 to 150 microns. Right, so it's quite small. And the STNet algorithm is scanning across those patches. It learns what are the important features automatically, what are the important features in each of those patches. And that's what we're calling this latent representation. And once it learns that representation, then it uses that information to impute the expression profiles of hundreds of genes right, uh, at each of those locations for each of the probes. All right, so this is the algorithm's trained. And with this, it's actually able to impute the expression profiles of 400 genes, right? And it's able to do that at you know, resolutions around 100 microns each. So it's actually fairly high spatial resolutions. So this was done on breast cancer patients. And we actually did a lot of rigorous testing to evaluate that the algorithm really works well. Right? So the best way to do testing is to actually really take very independent patients, independent data. So here we actually used data just generated by a different group. It's actually generated by 10X Genomics, so a different company. Um, and they have you know, different ways to collect these samples and even different, uh, you know, different imaging protocols, different sequencing protocols. So this is actually quite a strong test to see whether the algorithm that we've developed on our set of breast cancer patients, how well it will work on a very different set of data, for also from breast cancer patients generated in this different environment, a different context by 10x. And actually works quite well, remarkably well. Right? So each dot here corresponds to one gene. Right? So the x and y axis corresponds to the performance of the algorithm in predicting the spatial expression profile of that gene on two different test data sets. Um, and so the AUC is basically one of the common measures of how well the algorithm is doing. And we can see here in the top right corner, here I highlighted that in, in the red circle, but there's actually a, over 100 genes where the algorithm, STNet, actually is making very reliable predictions as compared to the experimental ground truth measured on these, both of these test sets. Right, so these are the 100 genes where you have AUC above 0.8, above 0.9. And these are the 100 genes where we think that the algorithm can really quite reliably generate, computationally generate these spatial profiles. And these 100 genes also captures many of the key genes that we're interested in. Right? So these include cancer biomarkers, immune markers, as well as genes that are really important for the mobility and architectures of the cells. Um, so the, the beauty and the power of this kind of approach is that once we train the algorithm, now we can actually do this and apply this to new data or where uh, we don't have the corresponding experimental measurements, right? Because the experimental measurements, while it's, it's great, but it's actually quite expensive and can be quite time consuming to still to generate, right? So there's still only a few groups around that can reliably generate these high throughput spatial transcriptome measurements. But the algorithm, once we have developed it, that can be applied potentially to, you know, to any image, including sort of archival images that uh, labs and clinics have already collected. Right. And we have, actually, we have actually tried this. We know we applied our algorithm and uh, this trained on our breast cancer data, and then we actually applied it to images from archives, from TCGA, and we also showed that they work quite well there. And we can also use the output of this algorithm right, to quantify a variety of things, including tumor heterogeneity, as well as to the extent to which you know, the, the immune cells are infiltrating into these different tumor regions, which can be captured from, this, um, from, from the uh, synthesized expression profiles. It's also very interesting to us to see what is it that these deep learning computer vision algorithms are looking at when it's trying to understand, the, predict the expression profiles of different genes. 
Right? So for example, here, so we were showing you know, sort of a zoomed in version of this, uh, of the biopsy. And highlighted in the bottom row are the regions where the algorithm SDNet is paying attention to when it decides whether this, each region actually has high FASN expression. Right? So FASN, again, is the breast cancer, one of the key breast cancer biomarkers. And it's actually quite interesting because here the algorithm actually learns to focal, focal, to focus its attention to relatively uh, a few locations in the input, which course actually corresponds to these enlarged nuclei in the cells, right? So the parts where it's paying a large attention to the red regions actually corresponds to these nuclei regions. So the algorithm actually learned by itself that if you actually have enlarged nuclei, that's actually symptomatic of high expression for this tumor factor FASM. So this demonstrates actually it's quite powerful to use this technology as also as a way to link gene expression profiles right, to actually to cellular and tissue architectures and morphologies, which could lead to sort of new and interesting biologies. So the, the final, I think the ultimate application of this technology that we're very excited about, right, is to really think of this as like an enabling platform, an enabling technology, right? So it's sort of like Instagrams, where it's instead of, you know, putting in sort of uh, filters for cats and for dogs, right? So now if we actually look at, uh, you know, one of the original histology images from a tumor, we can actually in real time have the algorithm generate the spatial transcriptome profiles for many of the key genes. And we can overlay those spatial profiles on top of the original image, like these filters. This I think can greatly enable prognosis and treatment design, especially where the tumor spatial heterogeneity is quite important. And as we've seen, it also opens up new hypothesis of how specific genes their expressions are linked to changes in cellular morphologies. Great. And in the second part of this presentation, the second story, I also want to tell you about how similar kinds of computer vision algorithms can, in addition to capturing spatial variations, can also capture temporal variations, right? Can capture morphodynamics. This is a collaboration uh, with, with my fantastic colleagues, Shalin, who's at the Biohub, and Tom, who's at UCSF, and it's work that's led by Michael, uh, who's a great PhD student in my group. So here's the setup is that you know, Tom and Shalin's group are interested in studying these microglia, right, which are kind of immune cells in the brain. So here's the image that Galena, one of our key collaborators, took right, of these microglia over 24 hours using label-free microscopy. Um, and what Michael did is that he actually developed a system right, to basically to automate, automatically track each, and study the morphodynamics of each of these individual microglia cells. Right? So it first tracks the individual cells, it classifies the different cell types that are involved. And then after that, right, you can think the algorithm, the computer vision algorithm, is sort of being like a private eye that's overlooking each of these microglia cells, except that it's doing this for thousands of cells in parallel. Right, so, for example, if I'm interested in this particular cell here at the bottom, right, so it's in this red square, I can, the algorithm would allow us to zoom in into that cell here on the right here, so the zoomed in version, and you can see that cell is actually having quite interesting interactions, perhaps it's even interacting with some neurons. And the bottom here, I can zoom into a second cell, right, if I want to be interested in its neighbor, I can see that this neighbor here is actually when I zoomed in, it's actually having quite different behaviors, right? It seems to be very active, maybe it's even spinning around, you know, uh, and even make out some of the subcellular organelles uh, within this within this microglia. So it's very interesting. They have very different behaviors. And it's, it's, these examples also highlight one of the challenges, right? Because these cells are behaving in quite complex and quite rich dynamics. And as we mentioned before, we don't really have a very precise vocabulary to even describe these dynamics um, uh, to, to make it quantitative. And this is where a lot of the machine learning and computer vision algorithms also becomes very useful, right? As a way to learn these representations and to learn these dynamics and learn the vocabulary. So Michael had developed quite a special kinds of deep learning algorithm. It's called a particle variant of an autoencoder. So think of this as a way to you know, take this input, these videos that we saw before of individual cells, right? And learns a way to represent these videos in a way that's easy to visualize, to understand. And by the process of doing that, it actually learns 
what we're calling like a morphology space, right? So this is like a new representation, a new vocabulary that the algorithm has inferred from these videos. So the, the power of this morphology space is that if I look at any of the particular cells, right, including this as an example, this cell here that we uh, zoomed in here, right? So the cell actually has, undergoes quite different changes and interesting behaviors. That cell now actually corresponds to a particular trajectory in this morphology space, right? So as it evolves over time, it actually traces out a trajectory in our representation. And if I look at a different cell, right, that actually traces out a different representation, a different trajectory. And I can look at this for you know, thousands of cells in parallel, right? Um, and these four cells here, uh, as, as examples, actually trace out four quite different trajectories. You know, some of them undergo quite large changes, others sort of stay relatively consistent over time. And this is really powerful because now we can actually look at any cell of interest right, under our microscope, and we can, we can really have a quantitative way to look at and to analyze what is the trajectory of these individual cells. For this particular microglia data set, it actually turned out to be quite interesting in that there are two very clear, seems like different clusters of states in this morphology space. Right, so I'm just calling this blue or red clusters corresponds to state one or her state two. Right, and you can actually quite clearly visualize these two states by looking at you know, this morphology space. Right, so each dot here corresponds to one cell. And I'm showing you a couple of examples of what representative cells right, in these two states. Right, so in the blue state, so you have these cells that look a little bit like couch potatoes, right? sort of lazy, they're sort of large, and they don't move around too much. Right. In the bottom here, you have these red cells, an example of a red cell in state two. It's much more energetic, right? It's moving, it's spinning around, sometimes it's interacting with its neighbors. So it's much more active. And we can also show some of the example trajectories right, of these two cells in these two states at, the, at this panel here on the top right. right. So in the blue state, right, these cells, even when they do move, they tend to be much slower, right? The speed is much lower. Um, and if they do move, they tend to move mostly along this long cell axis, right? So it's very different types of motion. Whereas it's clear from our analysis, right? That these red cells in state two, they're much faster when they move. And when they move, they're also moving in much more sort of a random walk in all the different directions, right? So these are the kinds of things that is now very easy for us to quantify and to describe, because we have this very precise data-driven morphology space of these trajectories of the cells. And what's really interesting here in, in this example is that when we actually did single-cell RNA sequencing of these microglia, in the sequencing expression space, there also turned out to be at least two broad, very distinct clusters. Right? So I also color them blue and red, so as to be, you know, to be quite suggestive of how they map onto the morphology space. Right? And indeed, we can actually experimentally demonstrate and validate that there is a connection right, between these two clusters in the expression space with these two morphodynamic clusters in the morphology space. Right? So we did several experiments, perturbations to validate this. You know, one example is if we actually stimulate these microglia with interferon beta. Right? So then the morphology space, they mostly move into this blue state Right. And similarly, in the transcriptome space, under the same stimulation, they also mostly end up clustering around a particular part of this blue state. Right. So by doing a set of these different perturbations, we're able to establish a linkage between the morphology clusters, morphodynamic states, with the transcriptome states. And I think that's really one of the really exciting directions going forward, is that with these computer vision technologies, as we've seen in both examples, right, we can learn powerful features to represent the spatial and temporal dynamics of the cells. And then we can actually connect that to rich information from the expressions, uh, either from spatial transcriptomics or from single cell RNA sequencing. So hopefully this talk gives giving you some examples, right? Uh, a couple of examples of how we can really take the recent advances of computer vision to learn about spatial heterogeneity of cells, to also learn about temporal morphological dynamics of cells, right? And really to integrate these ideas with powerful data and readouts from high dimensional, high throughput genomics. And I think this is especially relevant, especially promising and exciting as a way to really study human diseases, right? Um, 
with these multiple modalities of data going forward. We, in my group, we've developed a variety of ways to actually make it easy for, for people, for, you know, for biologists and for people who are not computer scientists, right, to interact with these computer vision algorithms. So, um, if, for example, if you go to radiohub.com, right, so th there's actually a, a place where we have developed and we put diff different interactive visualizations and different interactive versions of many of these algorithms where you, people can just interact with the models on their browser without having to download anything. And finally, I just want to thank the students and collaborators again. And a lot of the, the papers and codes for these different approaches are available on my website. And I also listed the, the references for each of the works that I described. Thanks for your attention. And please feel free to send me your questions.